same thing at Purdue University next week in Lafayette or West Lafayette, Indiana. And uh, you'll notice there's quite a, good, a bit of gospel in what I say. I can't separate the two. And at Purdue University, which I've been doing this since about the middle 50s, and uh, they say, now, Harry, we'd like for you to come. You draw God's crowds, but would you leave that Jesus part out? <laughs> I said, I can't do it. That's me. And if you don't like that, then don't invite me. You get me, you get Jesus. <laughs> and I can't help it, but that's the way it is. And I don't think we should compromise. I had one fellow come up to me and said, Mr. Khan, don't you believe in separation of church and state? I certainly do. I said, don't you believe in academic freedom? He said, yes, I just took some. <laughs> <laughs> I took it on the right side. I heard professors tell dirty stories, use my Savior's name in vain and all that. If they can do that, then I can exalt him. Amen. And the day I can't, I'll not waste my time in any university or college campus. Because my Bible says, in all thy ways, acknowledge him. And he shall direct thy paths. Now, I've been doing that so long down there, and I've taught a lot of fellows that wound up as executives at Xerox. And uh, I think it was about 10 years ago. Now, when you get my age, time flies. So I'm usually two or plus or minus two years off. <laughs> I got a three-page letter from an executive from Xerox inviting me to come and give two commencement lectures for them under their auspices. They didn't say where. Now, at that time, they were a very, very far-left company, if you know what I mean by that. And I knew it. So I never answered the letter. I was busy enough. So the man calls me. He talks to me. I said, well, if you don't know how I do it, I'm speaking for the National Association of Accountants in Ridgeway, Pennsylvania. Now, if you can find that without asking anybody, they'll give it to you. <laughs> <laughs> it's way over there in the sticks. And I said, it's closer for you than it is for me, so why don't you come down and you get a sample? So he did and came up to me after he says, and that's what we want with some modifications. <laughs> so he calls me in about three weeks. I still haven't answered him. Well, Mr. Khan, uh, you haven't answered our letter. I said, no, there's several things you left out of that letter. But by the way, it's about time you come and ask me to speak. He said, why do you say that? I said, because I got 50,000 shares of Xerox stock. He said, how'd you get that money? I said, I bought one, I Xeroxed the others. <laughs> <laughs> he didn't think that was a bit funny. <laughs> <laughs> so then he started doing with me what you should never try to do to a Scotsman. He said, we know what your fee is, and that's a lot of money. He starts trying to beat me down. Now, my daddy was a very even-tempered Scotsman until someone tried to beat him down on his prices. Then he would lose his equilibrium, and you want to get out of the way. <laughs> well, I'm not, I'm not that drastic, but... Uh, uh, I don't worship money, but it sure soothes my wife's nerves, you know. <laughs> and she and I have a lot of missionaries that depend upon us. And uh, I have to make the money as a consulting engineer now that I'm retired. And uh, I uh, don't come very cheap. And if I can get it, why shouldn't I? Why shouldn't I? If these doctors can get $19 for half hour working on your ticker, you know, 19000 So I think I ought to get my kind of fees. So I'm going to be at Purdue next week, and I'm going to give you a sample of what I'll be given there. And you kind of, pardon me if I go a little fast, because I realize much of this will not affect you. But when I get into teaching ethics near the end of this first part, we're going to have an intermission tonight.
about 10 minutes while we change from this to those slides over there. And uh, I think when you leave here tonight, you'll just about have a course in ethics. Uh, most executives in the United States, and I'd say over 98%, have not had a course in ethics. Last year, over 100,000 firms went bankrupt in the United States. Now, that's a lot. I have worked in what they call turnaround seminars. I've helped about 82 firms turn around to get out of bankruptcy. I'll tell you, that's very, very hard work. And I have to go into the reasons why and have to get into financial statements and some of these fellows can't read financial statements very well. But the first thing I tell them you must have is honesty. And when you buy something from a vendor, when, if you know you cannot pay it, you're being dishonest and you're being unethical. I mean, you, if you know eventually you can't pay for it, that's no different than stealing. It's a sad thing. There's a lot of people who think they're Christians and call themselves Christians that do that. That ought not to be so, my friends. Now, I told you the other night that one of our firms where I live in Rockford, Illinois, they got fined by the government for unethical practices, $107 million. And later, uh, two years later, they added $27 million to that. Now, if that happened today, with what I'm going to show you of mitigating factors and culpability factors. Culpability means a degree of guilt and the seriousness of guilt. After all, as you know, there's a difference between petty larceny and grand larceny. Petty larceny is stealing up to $25. About that is grand larceny. And uh, if some man steals a million dollars, a man has only stand, stolen $10 so he can eat, the penalty shouldn't be the same, should it? We have a saying in law that the penalty should fit the crime. Well, there are going to be, I'm not going to explain it, but there's going to be 38 levels of fines for corporations and companies and individuals. But that company in our town got hit like that two or three years ago, $107 million fine. If that happened today, there'd been about 12 of their executives go to prison. Nowadays, from now on, and all these things I'm going to show you, it took effect November 1st, 1992. It's not only going to find a company money. That doesn't hurt the average man, executive in the company. But when you give him five years in the crossbar hotel in a free suit <laughs> that doesn't fit, that does hurt. And it's about time we started doing that. Wouldn't you agree? So that's where I start, and that's why I have this slide up there, the sentencing guidelines. So I'll start by putting this one on there. Now, this is for individuals. It's not for corporations. You can see it right there, the third, fourth line down for individuals. The fines that you can see, they start at $7,500. This isn't peanuts, is it? And that's called a base level fine, but we have these base, we have fines with levels up to 38, which means a more serious thing. Up to 38, about 30 would be something like you've sold uh, some classified equipment and engineering to Iraq or to some enemy of our country. And then there would be also, we're going to see a lot of other things that would take, be taken into consideration. Now it says if more in the third, in the first column, the third rectangle down there, if more than one gratuity increased by Two levels. Gratuity means you've taken money from somebody that you didn't do anything to earn, but it's a, like a bribe. And then it's up to 15000 And if given to an elected official or some others, increased by eight levels, now you're up to 250000 
And that's really going to strain your piggy bank. You know that. Now, this is for individuals also. This is what it would be if you did make out your income tax. Now, even if you can't pay it, whatever it is, you must make it out, you send it in. And even if you don't make any payments for several months, you write to them and say, I can't pay it, would you give me an installment plan? That's to show good faith. But the good faith starts by making them out. And it's really amazing to me the amount of adult people that don't make them out. I don't know why they think they can get along with it and get away with it. But like I told you the other night and the other day in preaching on that, or teaching on that miracle where Jesus told him to cast his hook, and in the f first fish it comes up, he said, I'll have a coin in his mouth. What did he tell him to do with that coin? You remember? Let's see if you're listening. He said, go pay the taxes for me and for thee. That's showing that God is limiting himself to our cooperation. And second, we're to be good citizens, not be civil deadbeats like the Jehovah's Witness. Not to be, pay our share. Because there are some good things that come from the government, such as the postal service. <laughs> that's almost, <laughs> that's almost an oxymoron state <laughs> postal service. That's like army intelligence. <laughs> <laughs> or a contradiction in terms, you know. But we do get some, get some good things. Uh, like, for instance, you've got dandy highways in this state. And you've got state policemen to make it safe for you and I to meet here tonight. And we ought to be grateful for things like that. And they cost money, and those men have got a right to a decent salary. So we want to make certain, among all everything, that we are good citizens. Now then, I want you to notice how these, I won't go over them every line, but what they're doing is, they're giving the local judges and the federal judges in that area explicit instructions so it doesn't leave it to the, the area federal judges or the circuit court judges because the crooked lawyers can get to them because they have their bar associations, and they have their cookouts, and they have their uh, card parties, and that they, they all sleep in the same bed, is the way you say it. If you've ever been to court trial and business and things like that, those lawyers spend more time in the back room with the judge than they do out there working. And they make the deals back there, which people don't know anything about. Well, let me tell you, they're right down in black and white on these. They're not going to be able to do that. So, like it says here, fine from the base fine table. Double the personal financial gain. Double the financial loss cause. Plus restitution. And a longer prison sentence. Restitution before probation or supervised release denied. Otherwise, you're going to pay it back. And it's paid back before the fine is level. It's not considered punishment to make a restitution. So you can see Uncle Sam is getting very serious about all this crookedness. Because you remember, maybe you remember Ivan Bisky that stole about $900 million, paid back $600 million, so they only gave him two years in jail at a country club. Well, that's not fair. As I've said to some of you, when the Bible says an eye for an eye, a tooth for a tooth, that doesn't mean a retributive thing. It's vindictive. You're going to do it back then. What that means is the law is to be the same for the poor man as it is for the rich man. For the man that can't afford a real good lawyer, that's for the rich man. It's to be the same. That is the real meaning of 
Eye for an eye, tooth for tooth. It isn't teaching you and I to be vindictive. Not at all. Because our Heavenly Father isn't, and we should not be ourselves. All right, now these are base level five. See, I say they go up to 38 or more, and look at that, how much that 38 one is. Starts up there, $5,000. Based on the seriousness of the crime, I'm reading the bottom lines down there. Based on the number of crimes committed, notice how quickly amounts increase. This table is abbreviated, but shows the high and low figures before the culpability factors multiplied and added to the fine. Now look at these, my friends. This is corporations or unincorporated companies. Corporate penalties and how they figure them. All right, they go through and they compute how much money did the people who were found guilty did they gain? How much did the people they cheated, how much did they lose? Well, what you can do, you can add those two together. That, that they really get hurt that way. Or you can take this six million, but increases on the basis of culpability. Court also orders restitution. That means a fine plus the money that they were cheated out of. But look at some of the additional corporate losses of the people who have broken the law, been unethical. Look, public relations image. They're known as crooks. Executive time in prison. Legal fees and lost customers. Now, this is what we call culpability. Now, please notice there are two columns over here. Over on the left is the levels of culpability. But these multipliers, you'll see a minimum multiplier and you see a maximum multiplier. Now, what you do after you figure the culpability, and I'm going to show you in a moment here how they figure the degree of guilt a degree of guilt. Otherwise, how serious it, it really is. And then they will use that as a multiplier, but also if you have an ethics compliance program in your plan and you've taught your men ethics and you're serious about it, and from the president on down, it's sanctioned and it's serviced and they want to do what's right. For instance, if they hear of a man has done something crooked, they're to let the authorities know, have him arrested, Otherwise, if they do that with, uh, with the president knowing it, knowing what he's doing, but he didn't report it, he can go to jail too. He can, it's very, it's getting to the place where a lot of men don't want to be president anymore. Because <laughs> men can do things that you're not aware of. Like for instance, we had a, a product sales manager. Year after he's gone, a fellow came in and he said, who do I pay my $5,500 my $5, to? because so-and-so isn't here anymore. That was the, that's how much the man's bribe was going to be for that time, but he didn't know he had left. Well, we didn't know that he was knocking down on the company. Otherwise, that $5,500 would just gone on to our, the selling price to us, wouldn't it? Now, I had a man work for me. His name was Ray Mendoza. We hired him out of the Thunderbird School, he was a graduate of the University of Arizona, or Northern Arizona University, and got his master's degree in, in uh, international trade. And I was in on hiring this fellow. He ran our place in, in uh, Canada, but we own a bigger company in Mexico City suburb, and so we transferred him down there in the meantime, our company is sold and becomes a part of a conglomerate or a holding firm. So my boss, then, who's the president of the holding company, our headquarters at that time, and we're in uh, 
280 Park Avenue in New York City. And uh, he comes out to see me. He really didn't care for me one bit. He's a graduate of Harvard, and I witnessed to him. He didn't like that. That's too bad. I did it again. <laughs> <coughs> so he came to see me, and he sat on a chair to the left of my desk. And Ray came in, Ray Mendoza, sat down, who ran our Mexico City operation. I said, Ray, how's everything? He said, well, Harry, it's kind of slow. But he said, you can help me. I can give it quite a shot in the arm here today if you let me. I said, what do you mean? He said, I have a quotation here for the big steel mill you and I were in up in Monclova, Mexico. That's north of uh, Monterey, way up in the sticks. I said, well, what is it? He said, well, I have a quotation here for $600,000 for us to put one of our systems in. But they won't buy it at $600,000. They'll buy it at $630,000. I said, Raymond, it's a little backward. You usually want the lowest price and the best delivery. <laughs> well, you know, if you always got the lowest price and the best delivery, you don't need salesmen. <laughs> Am I right? Well, what else do you want to do? He said, well, I want you to enable me to charge him $630,000, and you give Mr. So-and-so and the Mexican government, you give him, let me uh, give him 30000 I said, Raymond, that's a bribe. He said, like this. And the president here, graduate of Harvard, said to me, go ahead, Harry, it's a way of life in Mexico. I said, it is not a way of life in Rockford, Illinois, and that's how, where I happen to live. And I said, I'm 62 years old. I think I can make it on home. I've never bribed anyone yet. And if I can, I'll go get a tin bill and go out to chickens <laughs> before I do that. I knew the chairman of the board who had about $600 million in the corporation because we had 22 firms. He had told me before, that's, go ahead, that's the way they do business. I, that's not the way I do business. I was raised in a fine family, and we didn't cheat anybody. And we not only gave them their money's worth, we gave them more than their money's worth. That's the way I was raised, even though I am of Scottish distraction, you know. <laughs> I told you, Scottish people are really tight. <laughs>
an extra 30 grand on it. Yeah. And uh, if you don't do it, you don't get the business. That's right. That's extortion, just like he said right there. Now, we're saying this so you kids learn some business language because you're going to be out there and you're not going to be here all your life. You, one of these days, Gil here and Russ is going to turn the nest over here and you folks are going to have to get out there in the workaday world and see how it works out there. And you'll find it's no picnic out there. It's a jungle out there. But the most important thing you can have when you go out there is integrity, is his honesty. They were in interviewing me once for a chief engineer after I'd left New York City. And I was chief engineer, second biggest engineering firm in the city. And they looked at my resume and they said, well, we like your education, we like your experience. But then they started talking to me about some things. I said, no, wait a minute. I better tell you where I come from. I said, you can hire better engineers than me, but you cannot hire a man with more integrity than I got. Now, which you want, a good engineer with integrity or not? Now, I also said, now, if you're looking for a chief engineer to wine and dine and booze with your customers and fix them up as women, you got the wrong mule for the year. I'm not going to do it. They said, we're not looking for a man like that, but why won't you do it? Well, I said, I got three reasons for not doing. First, the Lord Jesus saved my soul. And I love him. And I want to obey him. And I know that the Lord Jesus would not go along with these things that are done in industry. And I've had the heat put on me. But I want to tell you right now, I run up the gospel flag and tell you, if that's what you're looking for, let's don't waste each other's time. I'll go my way. He said, what's your second reason? <laughs> well, the second reason is, you know, you want to drink with the customers. Well, I feel good for nothing. Why should I pay for a headache? <laughs> <laughs> you, you give me a better reasoning than that, will you? <laughs> better reasoning than that. Third reason is, I'm an engineer. I wouldn't take old sugar and put it in the crankcase of my car. So why should I take that rotten stuff? All it can do is ruin your family, ruin your career, ruin your health. It's like shooting craps with, against your own money. You can't win. It's like taking dope. I said, I'm just not going to do it. That's all there is to it. About a week before, I'd been chosen to be the number two man in one of the biggest companies in Chicago, and when I gave him my Christian testimony, he said, oh, boy, that's all. That's all. If you wait till you hear our chief executive, the president, talk, and the way he swears, you guys wouldn't get along. You can bet your boots, buddy, we wouldn't. <laughs> First time he used Jesus' name in vain, I'm going to have a talk with him. I'd say, I'd, I would think I'd be working for an educated man. Educated men don't talk like that. you got a very, very limited... Vocabulary, people that talk like that. And you know what I found about men that curse and swear? I'm going to tell you. Because my, in my time, there were about 300 of us Christian chief engineers in the country. We'd get together and we'd swap our problems back and forth. We came to the conclusion that when these men came in to be hired, we always were the last guy to pass on. If they did a lot of swearing and cursing, what they're doing is they're cursing giving you a big smoke screen to cover up a monstrous inferiority complex at God's expense. Get that? Because out of the heart, the mouth what? What he does, he tells you what's in his heart. Tells you what's in his heart. And I, I, just, I just wouldn't put up with it. I won't. I've often said, the Lord seems to agree that i got to work for a living, but he lets me choose who. And many a man, I wouldn't work for him. I would not work for him. I got to work for a living. But God's given me enough skill, enough background, I can choose who I work for. And that's cost a lot of firms a ton of money, because I could have made them a lot of money. But the dirty mouth of the men at the top, I didn't want anything to do with. So, 
You see, when you stand up for God, he gives his brain power here where you can make your choices. <laughs> I didn't have it before I started standing up for Jesus. I told you I graduated in the upper 95% of my class. <laughs> I didn't say upper five. I said upper 95. You people are not a bunch of math majors. I can tell it. <laughs> <laughs> Should I tell them again? <laughs> that I was one of those people who made the upper half of class possible? <laughs> now, please notice these multiplying factors. Now, if you have burned the paper trail, we would say the invoices and all this so the FBI and the people can't follow the paper trail, and you haven't cooperated with them, and you don't have an ethics compliance program, your president's trying to help you cover up, they come up with a maximum multiplier, look at that, four times the fine. Now, that firm in our town, that would have been $428 million. But if you have an ethics compliance program and you really are sincere and you're good people, and when they've been notified of it, they've done everything they could to make things right, not burn any paper trail, but cooperated with the authorities, please look at this, friends. Hope I can make it here without hanging myself, but. You can have a mitigating factor of that or this, 0.05 instead of 4. Look at that difference, brother, Norman, that it can be. It does not pay to be crooked, Prince. It just doesn't pay. It's all or, it may for a little while, but then the chickens come home to roost. So you see how important these culpability factors and mitigating from base of five from on down there you can see it in the middle column they go from one to 0 0.80 on down to 0 0.05 in the next column over to 0 0.20 and look at the difference down here at the bottom they were fined two million eight hundred thousand dollars with a multiplier a culpability factor of four it became eleven million two hundred thousand but with cooperation and wanting to do what's right and was not a party of it, it became 0 0.05 or down to $140,000. That sure paid for it, to be honest with it. You know, many of these cases, they just simply put the companies out of business. Simply puts them out of business, those kind of clients. I think I had this one up there before. First mistake I made this year. <laughs> now look at that. Get that aggravating factor. Boy, we got a lot of, a lot of those, haven't we, Russ? <laughs> <laughs> See what they are. Look at number one, high-level official participation or willful ignorance. Two, tolerance of the offense pervasive throughout the whole organization. Any part of the offense committed five to ten years after a similar offense. Number three. Number four, judicial, violation of judicial order or probation. Five, unobstructed or obstructed or impeded justice during the investigation or failed to prevent obstruction. These, these are what we use in figuring the culpability factor. Now add your score to the base fine, number five. Notice how easy you can reach 10 or more real quick. Now, we're talking about mitigating factors. Now, please notice down here at the bottom where it says figuring culpability scores. <clears throat> one plus two must always be true to lower the fine. If you don't have number one and two, you cannot lower your culpability in any way, such as 
if you, no high level official involvement, no willful ignorance of offense. If you've had that, you, there, you cannot be, uh, your culpability factors cannot even be used. No matter if we do all these others here, violation promptly reported, full cooperation investigated, acceptance of response doesn't mean a thing if you don't comply with the top one up there. The two top ones. Somebody would say, well, Harry, are you trying to, and is the government trying to legislate morality? And, and I have people that accuse me of that. I've been on talk shows, and, and I've said to them, I say, yes, I'm trying to to legislate morality, and I don't know anything else you can legislate other than morality. I'm on a talk show in Dallas. This fellow called in and said that. I said, mister, this is an hour and a half program, 10.30 at night. I said, I want you to know, mister, there's at least 50,000 people in the Metroplex area, which is Dallas and Fort Worth, that are now sleeping in bed. They wouldn't be sleeping in bed if they thought they could have robbed a bank in Dallas today and got away with it and been promised that they could. They wouldn't be sleeping. Now, they didn't rob a bank, so I'm thankful for it. So they didn't do wrong. Get what I'm, now, the thing is this. You can let not legislate morality from a right intention of heart. Only the gospel can do that. Because when he saves us by his grace, gives us a new heart, we don't live for self anymore. We live to glorify God. And to serve our fellow man, to love our self. Ah, now it's altogether different. Whenever we obey the law, we would obey it if there was no law. Let me give you an example. Uh, about 20 years ago, the corporation uh, gave me a buy or sell agreement. I was the president, and I could either buy the company or I could sell the company. I didn't have money enough to do either. So I got together with a lawyer and our financial man, and uh, they said, well, Harry, we can raise this much money under the blue sky law without a uh, prospectus, which cost $50,000 to come up, about that thick. Now they're about $150,000. And uh, I said, well, I'll go ahead. But in the meantime, I nosed around and got to hold the law. And the law was in Illinois that you could not talk to over 15 people to raise 250000 That doesn't mean 15 investors. You couldn't talk anymore. They do that to pr protect the widows. Because a lot of these investment, yes, men, they read the obituaries every day, and two days after the funeral, they're out to see that widow and just pick her clean and a chicken if they can. Well, these kind of laws are to protect you for that, and that's for your good. And when I found out that there's only, that you can only talk to 50, let alone whether you get 15 people, and this financial man, he couldn't sell quarters for 10 cents. <laughs> <laughs> oh, what's your address? I'd give you him. <laughs> and I'm sitting in this meeting with this lawyer and this financial man. For, he's a Randy Cooper's Library and Ross Brothers, Schwartz, 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 and Flywheel accounting firm. <laughs> <laughs> I said, John, how many people have you talked to? He said, 35. And you don't have $250,000 yet? He said, no. And the lawyer says, that's all right, Harry. They can't police that law. I said, you don't need to police the law when I know it. <laughs> We're done right now. No more meeting, meeting closed. I'm going to sell it to Esther Line in New York City. See? As the Bible says, the law is not made for a righteous man. I'm not seeing what I can get away with. You get what I mean? Those two guys learned something there, that there are some people that take their Christianity serious. Yeah. Serious. Sure, they make 
call me a holy roller and holy Joe. That's all right. They didn't pin any medals on Jesus either, you know, and the other people I know. So now, you see, corporate financial gain, one million. They can either add those two or six either one, whichever, whichever is greater. Is your fine. Then they talk about the culpabilities, zero or less, or six million times 0 0.05, which would be $300,000, or three, yes, $300,000. See if this looks familiar to you. Does it? <laughs> let me let you read the bottom. <laughs> Three weeks last Friday, I had 20 company presidents I was showing this to. Wow. I leave that one up there a long time. <laughs> <laughs> you can see why I do it, can't you? Yeah. Maybe they don't go to church, but they're going to get some truth when I get <laughs> Then I'll back it up here a little bit and show you. Brother Dundatelli, would you read that for us starting at the top? <clears throat> All corporations, along with their managers and employees, choose their own ethical standards and choose their own rewards and penalties. You saw that here this morning, but what did I have in that top paragraph? You remember? I had a different word up there now, but the word means the same. What did I say? No cheating. <laughs> no peeking. <laughs> what is it, Bill? What's this up top here? Yep. Truth, love, persuasion. No, in the, in the rectangle. Uh, law or responsibilities? Law or responsibilities. There's no difference. <laughs> so, but I just put applications up there. Yeah. What's the difference? All right, now what am I saying? I wish I had a pointer. And I would put my hand up there, and I would say, you never have law without sanctions. Isn't that right? Law without sanctions is just advice. Is that right? The Ten Commandments are not advice, are they? Nor are they ten pretty good old country suggestions. <laughs> That's the way most people think they are. They ain't going to break them, so what? The bad thing is, many Christians are like that. They think it's optional as to whether they obey the Ten Commandments. When you choose an act, I don't care whether it's in business, your personal life, you're choosing also the consequences. There's primary consequences and there's secondary. Thank you, Russ. Pay him last month's wages. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks. So, here's what I say to them. <laughs> Be not deceived. God is not mocked. Whatsoever man sows, that shall he reap. Be not deceived. God is not mocked. Whatsoever man shows, sows, disobedience. He gets the penalties, and these are consequences here. That's just the way life is. And that's the way life works. And that's the way truth works. And that all law is based upon that. Without consequences or sanctions, it's not law. It's just advice. Now, there's plenty of advice in the Bible and Proverbs and the law. But the moral law is not advice. They're laws. If you break them, whether the government knows it or not, you're going to suffer for it. You're going to suffer for it. Many a man thinks he's gone out here and do something on the QT, and nobody finds out about it. And he thinks uh, he got away with it. No, he did. Now. There's a saying in the scriptures, which is in uh, Numbers 23, 3. Be sure your sins will find you out. 
Now, it absolutely does not apply to what we're talking about. Preachers quote it that way, but that's not what it is. Let me tell you what he's talking about there. Because this would hit about 95% of the Christians right between the eyes. So I want to give the real meaning of that. Be sure your sins will find you out. Now here were the Israelites on the eastern side of the Jordan River. On the op on Mount Nebo is to the south to their left if they're facing west. Where Moses is buried up there somewhere. And God has told them, now I want you to cross over that Jordan River. Joshua, once you get all these big Hebrew guys on their feet, get that Ark of the Covenant on their shoulders. You get marching toward that Jordan, and when you get in the Jordan, you get your feet wet. It's going to become dry land. And you know it was out of these banks at that time. Well, now... Some of these people that uh, in foreign missions, we say, oh, I won't be a missionary, but I'll stay home and be a prayer warrior. <laughs> well, they had them like that over there, too. <laughs> they said, Joshua, we're herdsmen. There's two tribes of the Jews, are herds and herdsmen. They said, now you go and fight, we'll raise the cattle. After all, an army travels on his stomach, you know. <laughs> You've heard that before, haven't you? And we'll stay back here. Oh, Joshua said, no, you won't. You get in the army of the Lord, or be sure your sins will find you out. This, you're no playing at this. You're going to divide the spoils, but you're also going to help us get them. It really wasn't any spoils. God didn't want them to do that. This is a righteous war. Well, a lot of people, we're leaving it up to the missionaries. Let me tell you something, dear friend. You're either a missionary right here in Pennsylvania or you're a mission field. Do you get that? A missionary never made a boat ride. Do you think it does? If you're not fit to go as a missionary, you're not fit to stay. You better get right with God. God doesn't have an army with just officers. <laughs> And just a few people with a lot of nerve? No, no. He's told us you're in warfare. But it's a spiritual warfare, a loving, and not taking vindictiveness out on, our, on the people who would mistreat us. But every one of us are to be a missionary. And this thing of thinking you get to go across the Rio Grande River to be a missionary, that is not Bible, because you're either a missionary right here in Philadelphia or Pennsylvania, or you sure won't be one when you get down there. So I say it again to you, if you're not fit to go, you're not fit to stay. You better get the altar and get it right with God. God doesn't have two standards. This is why my kids couldn't understand why we didn't live in a great big house like the presidents did in our town. A corporation one half as big as we. I'd say to them kids, let them obey their light, we'll obey our light. We'll obey our light. We're not going to be thinking about what other people are living in. We're going to live the way the Lord Jesus would have us to live and help the missionaries and the poor and the sick and the lame. See, if we know how God wants us to live, how the other guy's living, we spend all his money on himself, none of our business. We go ahead and we do. So, that verse back there in Numbers 23:33, when he says, be sure your sins will find you out, he's not talking about the guy who goes to take the woman to a motel. He's talking about people that play at being a Christian. That's what it's talking about. Or play at their relationship with God. That don't take it serious. That's also what it means in thou sh the third command, thou shalt make, not take the name of the Lord thy God in vain. Because... Dear friends, it's inferred and implied. You won't even have the coarse manners to use that blessed name in vain in a cursory way, in a cursing way. No, no, it's talking about people saying, I'm a Christian, but they don't take it serious. That'll be $5 for that little sermon right there. You know? <laughs> now, friends, look at this over here in the left. 
employee problems, fines, imprisonments, lower morale, poor quality, poor image, rebellion, lower profits, sometimes no profits. We need to get this optional stuff out of industry too. And here's one that I use to begin to start to do that. Friends, all your fines are not, all the consequences are not financial. Look at some of those, Bill. They have guilt doing it. They can't sleep at night. They have depression. They commit suicide. They have sickness. They have rebellion. have addictions. They hurt the innocent. There's a loss of privileges. Many go to prison, large fines, fewer jobs, many pe companies go bankrupt and out of business, higher cost than another. That's for being unethical. <laughs> ah, I want to show you some here for being ethical. <laughs> have you seen that one before, kids? Huh? I'm sure you have. Well, not just plain being good businessman, but I want to show you now what my friend Thomas Sowell, the great black intellectual, he gave me a four to add to this. You can read these columns in the Forbes magazine every week. If you get Forbes magazine, look him up. He's a black graduate of Harvard, got a master's from Columbia, PhD from the University of Chicago under Milton Friedman. I consider him one of the top G intellectuals in our country. Thomas Sowell. Now, he gave me here some things to add to this. I'd like for you to notice. Because the average accountant, he'd never heard of these. He's too busy saving paper clips and rubber bands. <laughs> we call them nickel nurses. <laughs> you need accountants, don't get me wrong. Just like a dog needs a tail, but it shouldn't wag the dog. <laughs> That's what the accountants want to do to the company. Rewards when you're ethical, when you got integrity and honesty, and you really want to do what's right, you want to serve your customer. Now look at the difference, Pastor. Look at that. You can extend more credit to people. Collect more taxes. The government can efficiently. People not trying to cheat. You know, these people would spend their time, as much time, and try to do a better job for their company and for their country rather than cheat the government out of income tax. Boy, we'd be living in a promised land. Create more joint ventures. Your company would make more money. Even take some of the employees who want to go in business for themselves and help them to get into business. Four, use pure resources for security. You don't need as many guards and all that electronic stuff if everybody in the place is ethical. And they got and the hoodlums around town know there's a good company that takes good care of their employees and cares about their employees. They're not even going to break into the place. And the unions don't bother you either. Unions never bothered any company that ever ran. They said, don't try to organize a company that guy Harry Cotton runs. He'll eat your lunch, man. Because <laughs> <laughs> he treats his employees right. He takes care of them. When they got trouble with the mortgage or a hospital bill, he takes care of them. Remember I told you, the only companies that get a union are what? The ones that deserve it. You treat your men right. Now, I don't mean to let them eat your lunch. You got to be a strong leader, or they will. But look at this. They're ethical. They're going to enjoy a higher standard of living. They're going to lower prices voluntarily. Therefore, they're going to sell more. Safer working conditions. More profit. More jobs. Lower costs. Every company. Now we have a thing. There's one of the brothers here that was. Uh, uh, led the song service tonight. He works in quality control, right, brother? And he and I have been talking about SPC. That's what we call statistical process control. And it does save companies. It doesn't cost money. It makes money, doesn't it? And that thing has kind of captured industry. But I tell them, 
you get real ethical in the way you should be, it's 10 times more advantageous than a good SPC program. Because he and I both understand CPK and those kind of things, which will help you, but can only take you so far. But ethics can just permeate the whole company. You can have men so they can't wait till they get up in the morning and get back to work. I know I've been that way. They didn't have to pay me more money either to do it. Because I didn't work for money. I worked as under the Lord Jesus Christ. And I wanted to make him look good. And when you got this kind of a program, those are the kind of benefits. You notice there's about twice as many here as there was in the last slide. company. We got some ethical decisions here. And we have it in two areas. One, it's in the area of right and wrong, and the other is in the area of economics. From right to left is economics. So here is a fella that makes a decision this way in the right and wrong, so he's right. He does what's right, what's ethical. And the economics is good, so he's a very profitable executive for the company. Ah, but here's a weak-kneed fellow over here. He thinks, oh, i got to pay him off. I don't get it. And, of course, with his quality being as lousy it is, he's probably correct. But when you've got the quality and you've got the good service and you've got the good benefits, good features on your program, you don't need to worry about it or on your product. So over here now, we got a type two decision. Well, we're right ethically, but some salesman got us to cut our price down here so he could get it and so he could pay a little bribery. So that's a bad deal, isn't it? So you see, there's four different ways that you can go. And men should be taught the ones, the ways not to go. Well, that's done sideways and it's really too big. Now, friends, when you have a company, you got stakeholders, and there's four different stakeholders in it. And every one of them must be taken care of in a right and reasonable and in an equitable manner. Stockholders got a right to a healthy return on their investment. But now look at the problems with the customer. They want quality, they want integrity, they want the right price, they want to deliver right, they want good service, and they want repair parts when they need them. Well, over here, the jobs, they got a stake in this company, too. So what? Well, they got their job, their careers, job security, working condition, opportunities for investment, and safety. Now, when you run the company, you got to take all those things into consideration. Ah, down here, the owners, they want a reasonable financial return, and they want a security on their investment. That means that the company is growing in financial strength, but also... It's growing in customer satisfaction and the numbers of custom and the strength and the skill and the education of their employees is growing too. And if you're a good manager, you've got to be looking into all three of these. Then the community down here. Community doesn't want to run down company. It pays a starvation wage and is polluting the whole environment, do they? So you see, when you're president of a corporation, boy, You've got lots of things to think about and many of them to worry about, and somebody's got to be paid for worry. So don't, don't criticize these guys running corporations and getting three, four million dollars a year, and some of them 16. They earn every penny of it, because I want to tell you something. Only one out of 65 men that become, that are 
capable of being present ever lived till they're 65 years because the pressure's too high. I worked with two great guys who dropped dead in the same year. Both of them capable, very, very capable. But the pressure from customers and from stockholders, and like I said, when you run a company, every stockholder's your boss. You got to talk to them. You be let them ball you out, not <laughs> not talk back. Then every customer's your boss. Isn't that right? You got to let them chew you out and not blow your top back and not defend yourself. Then when your employees get scratched, it's your job to bleed. It's your job to help. So to become a chief executive is not a step up to authority, it's a step down to servanthood. Step down to servanthood. So real good presidents, you don't have to go through three secretaries to get to them. Those are the guys, kind of guys that are affected. They don't keep the job very long. Now, I put another one over here. I want to get back to this. You need to know this. A friend of mine went to Harvard Business School. 13 weeks, you can get a PhD. 13 weeks. That's almost mail order. <laughs> A fine Christian guy, and one night after church, he got back. We sat down. I said, Ray, what did you learn there? He said, oh, boy, you're better off without what I learned. <laughs> he said, Harry, he said, they said to us, they didn't know whether it was important or not, whether to make a profit or not. That's what you call losing touch with reality <laughs> in, the, in the industrial sense of the word. I'm showing you right there nine different places when you're in a company where you owe a profit. You owe a profit. And it's unethical not to make a profit. Look at the first one. Stockholders got a right to a decent return. Many of them are widows. Their husband put that money away for them to live on. I was on the board of a company down in Florida that had taken Chapter 11. 20 years before I came on the board. In the second year, I nosed around. I said, now, you took Chapter 11. That doesn't mean you're not supposed to pay your debts. Bankruptcies only get you out from under the heat. That's all it's for. I said, what have you done about paying these 124 creditors? The answer was nothing. These guys were paying them big salaries. I knew them very well. I said, now, gentlemen, you say you like my work. Because the first year, I advised them financially on how to run the company. They made twice as much money as they ever made in their life. But I said, you're saying you're going to give $70,000 away to missionaries this year. Now, anybody that knows me knows I believe in giving to missions and giving till it hurts and giving till you can't feel it. But I said, that's not yours to give. And that's displeasing to God to give that money away when you've got 124 creditors. And if you want me to remain a consultant and to be a member of your board, you're going to get busy this year and do the, your very best at paying off this creditor because my Bible says, owe no man anything. And if you think I'm kidding, just don't pay him. Well, they, they saw what I said was right. It's right. It's reasonable. You know what? Be paid off. 122 couldn't find the other three. Paid off 122 creditors and still made over a million dollars that year, and they'd never made a million dollars in their life, and they'd been in business in 1925. God honors those who honor him. He'll bless the people that want to do what's right, who want to bring honor and glory to him. I said, now give all the votes you want. See, in my work, I can't demand anyone do anything. All I can do is advise. When I was president, if I said jump, all they had to do is ask how high <coughs> or when. But when you're a consultant, and they knew I, when they worked for me, I wouldn't ask anything unreasonable or anything I wouldn't do myself. Nobody in that place worked harder than I did. If you want men to work hard, you've got to lead them, not drive them. Well... That firm has just done wonderful because they did it God's way. So if you've taken bankruptcy, you better get busy paying those people. 
who you owed money to. The only reason for that is so they couldn't drive you nuts over the phone and, and harassing you. That's the purpose of bankruptcy. Not to get you out from under your obligation. Look at this. You owe a profit to your stockholders, to your customers, because if you don't make a profit, you're not going to stay in business. They can't buy repair parts and give you, have you given good service. You owe it to your employees. When I took over the Whitney Corporation, we had a man named John Bellotti. He'd been there since he's 16 years old, and he was 62 years old then. They told me if I didn't turn that corporation around that year, they're going to liquidate. I said, boy, where could poor old John get a job at his age? So I owed it to John to get that company turned around. And John Bellotti was one of the best workers in the whole place. I want to tell you how he got his job there. He couldn't speak English. And there were tough old Swiss people who owned it back there. When he went in, he went in to ask for a job. And they were so mean. And this guy, he said, get out of here. And he pointed to a burr bench. <laughs> so John Bellotti went over and picked up a file. <laughs> and he started be deburring pieces like the rest of them. And he worked there two weeks. He didn't have a time card. They all noticed he's the best worker in the place. <laughs> Finally, he got it across to one other Italian to tell him, when are you going to pay me? <laughs> 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 he's such a good worker, they got him a time card, and he was there 46 years when I got there. <laughs> That's how he got his job. Oh, brother, those kind of stories thrill me in a worker like that. And he and I were buddies. All those kind of people, I did. But look at the next down there. Community, who wants a run-down company that doesn't pay a livable wage and contribute to good worthwhile projects? Credit competitors, you know that's a, that is the healthiest thing we have in the United States in business. In socialist countries, you don't have competitors. All you got is high prices and low productivity. I did a lot of work in England my time, and I'm walking through one of the plants over there, and a man said to me, Mr. Khan, uh, what do you think of this plan, the way we're working? I said, well, if I ran this plan, I'd paint lines about that far apart from one end of the plant to the other. He said, why? I said, everybody walks that way, and then I could tell whether they're moving or not. <laughs> <laughs> I said, your employees act, act like they got the seven years itch, and they're three years behind their scratching. <laughs> I never saw such a bunch of sleeping beauties in all my life. <laughs> you are profit to your creditors because if you don't make a profit, you're not going to get paid. And they got a right to be paid. But look at the next one. The good old Uncle Sam. I just don't think you owe him 34%. <laughs> look, number six. If you're not making money and losing money, the bankers don't want you. And if you lose your bank, no other banker wants you, and then how are you going to have an exchange of funds, whether you're paying your help or your customer's paying you? Your banker is very important to you, whether you like him or not. I know one of my favorite expressions is he's, he's <laughs> it's colder than a banker's heart, but that's a <laughs> but I'm just kidding. Because bankers are necessary, and you need to make a profit, and you need to take care of those fellows. Look at the next one, public. If your company goes bankrupt, three others will, because all the crepe hangers, it'll be on Ted Koppel, it'll be on this one, it'll be on, this company went bankrupt, whether it's true or not. They're a bunch of crepe hangers, and they just love to talk this country in depression. You owe it to the public to make a profit. You owe it to every one of those places right there. Now, when you get to run these companies, you've got organizational dilemmas. And we can anticipate many of them. Dave, would you read that for me, please? Organizational dilemmas. We can anticipate innumerable needs. Customers are concerned about our product or service. They are concerned about quality, price, timeliness and availability. 
Employees are concerned about their jobs and their careers. They want fair wages, job security, good working conditions, and opportunities for advancement. Members of the community expect our enterprise to be a good citizen. Specifically, they expect you to provide stable employment, pay our taxes, and not pollute the environment. By the way, I have about six more slides along that line of what we can do. And the companies like Prince, this one right here. Would you read those for us? Anticipated dilemmas. Customers versus employees. Customers versus owners. Customers versus community. Employees versus owners. Employees versus community. Owners versus community. Yes. So if you're afraid of conflict, you don't belong in business. Go get a job teaching school. Then you get, and if you're in the public school, then you get 24 little darlings that never been spanked. <laughs> you think you ought to have your training as a lion tamer. Because <laughs> I know I taught school. Ah, here's my greatest subject. You ought to get a, Screen stretcher here. <laughs> Can you read that for me, Bill? Natural law. Natural law is the theory that universally accepted That's right. principles supersede written law when the two come in conflict. Now, friends, uh, I've been going quite a while. We'll take a 10 minute break. Do you remember when Clarence Thomas was being quizzed? by Ted Kennedy, Joe Biden, and Senator Heflin from, <laughs> from Alabama. Talk about Alababy. <laughs> and they made fun of him, and they almost cut and quartered that guy, skinned and quartered him, because he said he believed in natural law. Now, when you come back, I want to prove it to every person in this room that has all their ball bearings that they believe in natural law. Because if they don't, it's because they don't understand it, and nobody's explained it to them. And when we get back, we're going to start with that. Then I got 64 other slides over here, which I'm not going to use tonight. <laughs> <laughs> You'll probably all tip me when this is over. <laughs> so let's take a little break right now, and I'm going to get something cold to drink, and my throat's begin to feel like the dusty road in Indiana. <laughs> so thank you so far for your kind attention. <clears throat> By the way, when Thomas Jefferson wrote the Declaration of Independence and the work he did also with his 55 men that come up with our Constitution, he said it's based on natural law, a natural law that he learned from Thomas Locke, who had a book on it over in England. And I have a friend, a graduate of Harvard Law School. He became a congressman. And I said to him, did they teach you natural law at Harvard? He said, I never heard of it at Harvard in the law school. I was out of Harvard a long time before I ever heard of natural law. See, the, what the lawyers did at the turn of the 19th century, they went to logical positivism, which was to get rid of the Bible. They said, everything's got to be scientific and follow the laws of logic and evidence and that kind of stuff. And so they just got rid of anything Christian in it, especially natural law, because they knew the basis for natural law was the moral law. Now, the main scholar in, mor in natural law today in this country, his name is Peter Stanless, former head of the Department of Humanities, University of Detroit, also at Rockford College, and Peter is one of my best friends. And Peter said in this lecture that you're going to hear, and you have heard, three weeks ago, and he paid me a great compliment, and that was this. He said, Harry, I learned a lot from your lecture. Now, you can go buy his book in the newsstands, Edmund Burke and Natural Law. Now, you people ought to get acquainted with Edmund Burke. Edmund Burke was one of the greatest brains that ever lived. He stood up in Parliament during the war, the Revolution, and said, we should not be fighting the colonies. They are right and we are wrong. This is a war 
of principles. And their principles are right and ours are wrong. Ten years later, when the French Revolution came on the scene, there were some people from England went over and looked at it who could not evaluate it, came back and said, boy, that revolution over there is what we need. Edmund Burke went over there and he spent a year looking at it. He came back and he said, don't you compare that French Revolution with the American Revolution. There's no similarity whatsoever. The way you would say it today is that those Jacobins that are doing that are nothing but a bunch of hippies. <laughs> Rich, young, incorrigibles. That's all they were. He said, there's no way. That is not a revolution of principles like the American Revolution is a, a war of principles. I heard a fellow named Mike Ryko of far left liberal columnist in Chicago. You probably carry him here in the Enquirer. They, they carry about anything that far down and far left. <laughs> <laughs> I heard him say one time, on a talk show, oh, I'm for Nicaragua. They're in revolution. After all, we came out of revolution too. Oh, not the same kind of revolution. Nothing at all. He didn't know enough history to know that. But yet he writes a column. And Americans sit there and listen to that saying, yeah, we should help them. We came out of a revolution. But nothing like that revolution down there. Oh, my goodness. That was no, no comparison. Now, friends, you ought to write that definition down. You ought to memorize that. Because, let me say this to you. And I'll show you slides to bring this out. Over 95% of the different civilizations in this world where we have sent sociologists and anthropologists and missionaries, they have found that those people have a moral code. Even if they have their language and writing, they've got to even list it up. Many of them don't, but they have a moral code so similar to the Ten Commandments, you can't hardly tell it apart. Now, what do you think that is? Where do you think they got the moral code? Don't all answer once. What? No. Yes and no, but. Passed down from generation? From when? From where, though? From. <clears throat> There's a specific time in the scripture. Oh, time of what? No. No. Before no. <laughs> uh, How about at the Tower of Babel? What did God do? He scattered them all over the face of the earth because he's disobedient. But like you said, they had this self evident code which in the scriptures say that this is the light that lighteth every man that cometh in the world that he knows right from wrong now your first three or four or five years a child is by instinct but from then on intuition takes over instinct has to do with physical things but intuition intuitiveness has to do with thinking and this is a light that lighteth every man that cometh in the world providing he hasn't been educated away from his common sense <laughs> you get that? You got to put that part in. We didn't have to put that part in before this century, but since then, have because of the screwy. But, but that thing right there. So here is Ted Kennedy and Joe Biden making fun of Clarence Thomas for saying he believed in natural law. I believe if I could have taught. Clarence Thomas, for a half hour, he had approved it to the whole United States and those three fellows that they believed in natural law. Now watch how I do it. And I will need somebody out there to read for me. I want you folks to follow. That way I can go longer because my throat won't hurt me so much. Who's a good, strong voice? Read that. <laughs> natural law definitions. St. Thomas defined natural law as a divine wisdom which is made known to us by reason and which require the observance of the moral order. Now, the next name is 
Geisler. They left the I out of that. I had a seminary class under this fellow one time. He was very young when he taught it. I don't think I would let anyone teach ethics that isn't 40 years old. <laughs> You're about 40 years old before you find out about half what they taught you in college isn't true anyway. <laughs> Sorry, go ahead. Natural law is described in the Bible as that which human beings do by nature. It is the law written on the hearts of all men. See Romans 2.14. Those who disobey it go contrary to nature. Now, what were we saying about Romans 1 there? Yes, but all those things that were listed there, those terrible sins, what did we say and what does the Bible say that they're without what? Understanding. Without natural affection. Those things are not natural to man. That's why they bother him so. All right, keep going, Brother Bill. The natural law condemns such things as wickedness, evil, greed, depravity, stealing, cheating. The actions opposed to it are envy, murder, strife, deceit, and malice. Those who oppose it are called gossips, slanderers, God-haters, insolent, faithless, arrogant, and boastful. Professor Richard Weaver. Now, he, he makes this last statement triumphs over nature exact terrible consequences. I, I want you folks to think about that last statement down there and tell me what the word exact, which is a verb there, what does it mean to you? What is it, think about that statement. You will never, ever read anything in such a short sentence which will mean so much and have so much wisdom in it. He is the man who wrote the book Ideas have consequences which turn over 10,000 seminary university professors from the left to the right with his book, Ideas Have Consequences. And every, every one of the intellectuals in this country has read that book, Ideas Have Consequences. And he tells them, written in 1948, the way we're teaching, we're going to turn out a nation of moral idiots. Have we? <laughs> Think of that statement right there. What does it mean to you? And what does the word exact, which is a verb, what does it mean? To bring about. What? To bring about. To bring about. That's right. But now, give me some examples of this in everyday life. Life is full of them. Yes? Homosexuality and AIDS. That's right. Drug use and AIDS. Homosexuality brings AIDS. And they think they they have triumph over nature. That word triumph should be in quotes. Now, when we put something in quotes, what does that mean? What does it mean to you? You have to look at it carefully. And also, it's, a, it's doubtful. If you say he's smart in your letter, and then you put it in quotes, <laughs> says, look out. <laughs> look out. Study very closely. It's doubtful. That's a very polite way of doing it instead of calling it dummy. <laughs> <laughs> right? Now, that statement right there, that's in my, from my book, Four Children Horses. But friend, and that this fellow, Richard Weaver, you should get his book, Ideas Have Consequences. And they certainly, see, Bill? Buckley got a hold of that when he's a senior at Yale, and it turned him from the left to the right. And in 1953, he wrote a book, God and Man at Yale, which he blew the lid off the Ivy League, showing how anti-God and how anti-government they were. And thousands of professors turned from the left to the right, and thousands of thinking people saw they had been deceived. But this is the man who had the biggest part to do it. He was a Southern Presbyterian. He's dead. He died in 63. He only went to church twice a year. Some would criticize that, but you've never been in Presbyterian churches in Chicago. <laughs> <laughs> you get my point? <laughs> what do you think about what Geisler has to say there? I'm going to put it up there, what he's calling your attention to.
Read that book. Dave, please. Romans 1.18, For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who hold the truth in unrighteousness. I want to quote you a verse. This is Second Titus, I mean Titus 2, uh, 11, 11. For the grace of God that bringeth salvation hath appeared to all men, teaching us that denying all ungodliness and worldly lusts that we should live righteously and soberly and godly in this present world. The grace of God that bringeth salvation hath appeared to all men. Otherwise, they've got to shut it out of their mind if they don't want to obey. You can sit around saying oh, 24 hours a day, there is no God, but you know, unbelief never altered one fact. <laughs> Isn't that right? For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who hold the truth and unrighteousness. I will read this one. These are from the Bible, the Holy Word of God. You read that for us, brother. Romans 2.14. For when the Gentiles, which have not the law, do by nature the things contained in the law, these having not the law are a law unto themselves. Otherwise, you can go to the heathen in the jungle. If you can converse with them, you'll find out that they've got a system of morals, Laws, just like you and I have. Why? Because God created man with an intuitive knowledge of right and wrong. Now, what did we say in the definition of moral law? Somebody? Now you got to get back to this. Because you got to realize our government and and lawmakers, legislative bodies make a lot of laws. They may be illegal, but they're ungodly and they're not acceptable to God. I'm going to give you an example. What's the definition of natural law? It's the theory that uh, universally accepted principles supersede written law when the two come in contact. Supersede written law. That's what the laws of men have possessed, someplace called common law. They, natural law supersedes it, which means the other is to take a back seat or be subordinated to it, and natural law is to be the highest, and we obey a natural law. All right, then, every one of these civilizations has it in there, thou shalt not murder, thou shalt not kill. What does that do to making abortions legal? Does that mean it's okay for a Christian then? Because the government says it's legal? <laughs> I should say it doesn't. How many of you know what the Dred Scott decision was in the Supreme Court? What? That's right. Legalized slavery in the Supreme Court said it was. A terrible blot on ours. And even 30 years before that, England had outlawed slavery without fair and a shot. Without fair, because they knew it was wrong. But over here, even by the time of Civil War, slavery was no longer an economic <laughs> thing to, but they, they didn't want to give it up. They didn't want to give it up. And if we hadn't had the Civil War, the slavery would have been gone anyway by 1875, as it was. We lost more men. Now, the war was no fault over slavery. But you want to remember, in the Civil War, we lost over twice as many men, I mean killed, as we lost in World War I, in World War II, and the Korean conflict. Twice as many. See, what's that old verse that says, Righteousness exalteth the nation, but what? Sin is a reproach to any people. I'll tell you, we sure paid, our country paid dearly for the sin of slavery. 
And just because the Supreme Court said it was okay, that doesn't make it okay, does it? Because thou shouldn't do to another man what you wouldn't want done to yourself. We're going to see that here in a little bit. For when the Gentiles which have not the law, it means in writing, do by nature the things that contain in the law, these having not the law, are law unto themselves. There isn't a law school in the country you can go to today and take a course in natural law. Wow. The whole basis for our Constitution, for our Declaration of Independence, and all the law system, and they are as ignorant as dirt of natural law. My friend, Congressman John Conlon, told me, he said, Harry, I went through Harvard Law School and never ever heard of natural law. Because, you know, Harvard has been an anti-God college since 1805, when they went Unitarian. Yet, Harvard was founded by the forefathers to train missionaries to go reach Indians. So was Dartmouth, so was Princeton, so was Cornell, so was Brown. But now we need the Indians to go reach Harvard, Yale, Dartmouth. <laughs> but I don't think he knew to happen at all. <laughs> all right, now, Mr. Norman, would you read that one for us? Romans 2.15. To show the works of the law written in their hearts, your conscience also bearing witness, and their thoughts to me while accusing or excusing one another. See, this is what God says about it. That's what counts, isn't it? Now, <coughs> I want you to look at this one. Very closely. And Mr. Norman, would we, you be kind enough to read that for us? Proof. The kind of reaction that manifests the natural moral law was brought home forcefully when a professor graded a student's paper written in defense of moral relativity. What do we mean by moral relativity? No objective truth. There's no That's objective right. Truth. No objective truth. Which means you get situation ethics which is, thou shalt not steal, ordinarily. <laughs> thou shalt not commit adultery, unless it's she's good looking. <laughs> well, that's but what he's saying. Don't commit adultery unless you're going to get caught. If you're going to get caught. Now, does that make any sense to you? Thou shalt not steal, ordinarily. That's what situation ethics is saying. Now, go ahead, brother. After carefully reading the law research paper, the professor wrote F. I do not like blue folders. <laughs> the student stormed into his office protesting. That's not fair. That's not just. The student's reaction to the injustice done to him revealed, contrary to what he wrote, that he truly believed in an objective moral principle of justice. <laughs> the real measure of his morals was not what he had written in his paper, but what God has written on his heart. What he really believed was right manifested itself when he was wrong. <laughs> See, he's written a paper on moral relativity. Nothing is absolutely right, nothing is absolutely wrong, and he's absolutely sure. <laughs> Until it happens to him. <laughs> Till it happens to him. Then what does he do? He blows his top, doesn't he? He goes in there and says, that's not fair, that's not just. Oh, wait a minute, I thought he didn't believe that. See, he doesn't, he's saying there's moral relativity. Well, he didn't really believe that when it happened to him, did he? Now, I'm going to tell you, there isn't a man in Washington in the Senate or the, or the Congress that likes to be lied to. <laughs> right? <laughs> or likes to be cheated. Why? Why? It's wrong. He knows it's wrong, but now it's happening to him. <laughs> See what I mean? But you ought, to, you ought to really think of that one here. Here is a young man that has written a well-researched paper on moral relativity. He hands it in, and the professor grades it, gives him an F, and puts a note on there, I don't like blue folders. 
which is a very arbitrary statement. <laughs> but the kid blows his top then, doesn't he? And he's got a right to, but he tipped his hand. <laughs> he tipped his hand. You could do the same thing with Ted Kennedy, with Joe Biden, and with Professor Heflin down there, too, and every one of those guys. You give me a half hour with them, I could get them to blow their top so many times. <laughs> <laughs> Why? They do believe in natural law, because they don't like to be cheated. Now, you watch these next Would you please read this one louder? Sure. Bring the bottom up. <clears throat> Proof equals our inclinations. We know what is right and wrong by our natural intuitions. Our very nature predisposes us in that direction. Being selfish creatures, we do not always desire what is right, but we do nonetheless desire that it be done to us. This is why Jesus summarized the moral law by declaring, in everything do to others what you would have them do to you. Matthew 7, 12. Confucius recognized the same truth by general revelation when he said, never do to others what you would not like them to do to you. <clears throat> Natural law is not hard to understand, it is hard to practice. We know what we want others to do to us, even if we do not always want to do the same to them. The natural law, then, can be best seen better in human reactions than in actions. In human reactions than in actions. That is, one's real moral beliefs are manifested not so much in what he does, but in what he wants done to him. Some may cheat, but no business persons want to be cheated. Others may be dishonest in their dealings, but none of them want to be lied to in any of their deals. Why don't they want to be lied to? It's wrong. And they know it's wrong. You see, what we've done intellectually, we've played down and we've played dead. Left our brains somewhere in our country. Thomas Jefferson, those great thinkers we had, they come back here and they, if they'd ever debate with these guys in, in the Senate, they'd stop it in five minutes if it was a fight. <laughs> you know what I mean? It's a mismatch. They're a bunch of lightweight thinkers is what they are down there. Now, let me tell you something. If anybody should not be lightweight thinkers, it's God's people in whom the Spirit of God dwells. Because he tells you and me, if you lack wisdom, let him ask of God, and he giveth him all things, and giveth liberally to him that asketh. We are given up our, our country by default. By default. You can see that. I've never had anybody ever argue with me on that. And boy, I've shown that to some of the smartest men that there is in the Midwest. And I'm going to do it next week at Purdue University. Now, let's read this one. I may disagree with this man theologically, but he was the first great economist this world ever had, and this man was a granddaddy of the free enterprise, free market system, which we have. Most church people don't know that. But in theology, he was terrible. <laughs> 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 I'm not the only one that says it. Thomas Jefferson said it too. And that's why the Puritans, who have really boogered up American history, because if you wouldn't buy Calvinism, they would call you a deist. And they called Thomas Jefferson a deist. Now, he says, and I've read it in his writings, he talks about Jesus Christ, my Savior, and he talks about judgment after death. That's not the language of deists. Deists are people who believe there was a God that created the world, and they withdrew from it and exercised no control or anything to do with it until he destroyed it. Thomas Jefferson, believe me, was not a deist. 
One man said, well, he made his own Bible. No, he didn't. Let me tell you what he did. He did something I've often thought of doing myself. He went to a Bible. You've seen Bibles where all the words that Jesus said are in red, which is a good thing. It's hard to read, though, when you're up in front of a bunch of people. So what Thomas Jefferson did, he took a Bible, and he took a pair of scissors, and he cut out all the words, everything that Jesus said in the New Testament, pasted them together, he said, so I can get it right straight from him without all this other stuff around it. I'm not saying it's wrong. I'm not saying it's right. And I've been may have been very helpful to him. But let me tell you something. The Puritans couldn't deal with him because they tried to give him original sin. He said, oh, no, this is old Augustinian philosophy that never came into the church till 400 years, and he got it from Manichaeism, and he'd give him a history on it. That would just blow him away. He believed in Christ. He believed in God. But he didn't believe in Calvinism. So they write him off and, and misrepresent that man's character as a deist. No, no, he was not a deist. But I'm going to tell you something. A lot of well-meaning people, not all liberals, have distorted American history. Just distorted because they didn't agree with the man's theology. That's no reason. That's dishonest. All right. How about you, Mr. Cook? How about you reading that one for us? John Calvin, <clears throat> just like Augustine and Aquinas before him, Calvin believed that natural law is ingrained by God in the hearts of all, that there exists in the human mind and indeed by natural instinct some sense of deity we hold to be beyond dispute. He contended that there is no nation so barbarous no race so <coughs> brutish as not to be imbued with conviction that there is a God. This innate knowledge of God includes a knowledge of his righteous law. He calls this moral awareness natural law, which is sufficient for their righteous condemnation. By means of this natural law, the judgment of conscience is able to distinguish between the just and the unjust. Not only is the natural law clear, it is also specific. It includes a sense of justice implanted by nature in the hearts of men. There is imprinted on their hearts a discrimination and judgment by which they distinguish between justice and injustice honesty and dishonesty. It is what makes them ashamed of adultery and theft. The natural law even governs good faith in commercial transactions and contracts. Even the heathen prove their knowledge that adultery, theft, and murder are evils and honesty is to be admired and esteemed. Calvin summarizes man's natural knowledge of law as that which states that one action is good and worthy of being followed, while another is to be shunned with horror. Now, friends, you know that natural law is the basis for all international law, which was written by a Christian man in the first textbook called uh, Hugo Grotius, a Dutchman from Holland, could read Greek and Hebrew when he's eight years old. He wrote the first textbook on international law. He also wrote the first good book on the atonement. He was a real brain, a real scientist. And there were three buddies that kept Jacobus Arminus from being burned at his state. They were Isaac Newton, Kepler. Those two came up with calculus. And uh, Hugo Grotius. And they would have killed him if they thought they'd get away with it. But God had given him favor with the three biggest brains of the world at that time. That's all that saved Jacobus, our minister's life. Anybody really knows history knows that. Now, you see, let's say we're going to have a, a contract with somebody over in, in uh, Saudi Arabia. Now, I've done lots of work on a Persian God. And let's say over in... Uh, Pakistan. And uh, let's say somebody in uh, India. 
One's a part of the other. <coughs> you know what they're based on? Natural law. To this day. Because, for this reason, when we say thou shalt not steal, you can find that in, in the Arabic Muslim religion. They have it in there. In the, in the, with the Hindus, they've got it in their religion, in theirs too, and I can show you it right in writing, where they say, and then you can go to Confucius too. He says, do unto others, you'd have others do unto you. So you can't say we had to do this on the basis of the Bible. We do it on the basis of intuitive truth that man is born with, and they will agree that that, that so we can take a back seat to being so dogmatic about it, because you couldn't do international business if, if it wasn't for natural law. It's all based on natural law. And the first great textbook written by a Christian, they still use it. You, you go groceries on natural law, you can find it in any good university library to this day. So, you see what I'm saying is, Natural law is the basis for all international business. But they can agree because their religions too don't countenance stealing. They don't countenance murder. They don't countenance a lot of other things. Now that's not to say that they agree with us and everything. Because I had a friend, I think I told you about it, a writer from McGraw Hill. His daughter married a Muslim. And they moved over there to Egypt. When they got there, the poor girl found out the man already had three wives. And that year, she committed suicide. There's no way out. No way out. But we're not talking about marriage. <laughs> you see what I'm saying? We're not talking about marriage in the international law. Because that isn't in the Ten Commandments, is it? See, adultery is, but, but polygamy isn't. In fact, is uh, some of our great old saints in the Old Testament had more than one wife. I don't know how they could afford it, but they did. <laughs> <laughs> well, friends, it's, it's late. It's 10 o'clock. I, I was going to use, really, I was going to use all these slides here, but I, I think I'll do that tomorrow night, if you don't mind. Because... There really is, there's 46 in there, <laughs> <laughs> having to do with ethics. And this is where I, I'd get in like I was teaching in a college, a course in it. So would you dismiss this, brother, please? Father, we thank you, Lord, that we've had this opportunity to, uh, Lord, just consider these truths, God, that are so important to us in our, in our relationships with one another, God, in our ability to please you, Lord. Lord, we just want to be able to apply these things, God, to represent you, to honor you, Lord, and, and everything we do. Uh, we thank you for Brother Harry being with us, God. Lord Jesus, and bless him, bless him uh, richly, Lord, for being here with us, Lord, and sharing these things. And uh, just pray, Lord, that we would honor you in our fellowship tonight. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.